as one piece of a, of a highly complex mo molecule uh, with lots of ways in, or maybe you should think of spokes on the wheel, but lots of ways in, many ways to get engaged. So whether you're new to this work or you're deeply familiar with it, we hope you want to stay connected either with us or with some other group you'll hear about, some other group that's represented here. Very concretely, practical plea, you'll, you're going to get next uh, by, I think, uh, noon tomorrow, a questionnaire in your email inbox that's going to ask you about the level of engagement you want to pursue. Please answer that questionnaire. If you don't want to be engaged, we completely understand people are so busy, but it gives you a chance to tell us at what level you want to stay connected with us. So please fill it in. So to the workshop uh, quickly, we set up the problem in the workshop like this, recognizing there are many other ways to cut this cake. The question was, the humanities and interpretive social sciences are facing challenges, cuts, decreasing enrollments, decline in faculty lines, increased public skepticism. What can we do locally um, at, at our campuses? And we started by identifying constituencies and obstacles to, to the work. Now, from my own experience as dean and provost, and this was all echoed in the workshop, one of the biggest obstacles to change is that it comes from so many different directions. Uh, there are deans who are pressured by CFOs who are worried about enrollment drops. Uh, there are students eager to change what they see as overly traditional approaches to scholarship or um, overly exclusive ex syllabuses or reading lists. So this creates what I have often felt it feels like a, an impossible pressure on faculty. So they, they go to the dean's office and they say, are you, are you kidding me? Is tuition really the driver here? I have to think about enrollments. I mean, you know, don't leave me alone. I'm gonna to stick to my guns and, and preserve what I know. Then they go back to the department and they see students uh, who want change. And they say, students, please, the Dean is putting pressure on me, bear with us. We can change around the edges, but we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, so I'm, I'm just trying to give a vivid spotlight of, you know, my understanding of how conversations about change really happen in real life at, at colleges and universities. It's a picture where often, not always for sure, but often everyone ends up unsatisfied at best and feeling betrayed at worst. And a bunch of half measures get taken and not much really changes. And that, that can happen, often does happen at universities. As when I was provost at the CUNY Graduate Center, I was told by a very friendly critic in a way I'll never forget that I had to re remember one fundamental truth as a change oriented administrator that faculty could just wait out my change related initiatives until I had moved on. You know, that, and that's a real truth about the, re, the lived reality of, of academia, it's the kind of level, again, that the um, design workshop sought to work, work within. Uh, second big obstacle to change is that while our system is very deeply fragmented, it's also deeply interconnected. Uh, and so here, an example I'm sure will be familiar to everyone, if an individual department wants to change what counts for tenure in, in, their, in their view, they want to open it up, expand requirements, they can't, of course, do it alone. They've got to convince their school-wide committee, and then they've got to be aware that tenure typically relies on external letters being written by people who may not know about this change that's going on locally in that department, may not agree with it, and they don't, of course, want to put their junior faculty at risk. So, so we're, we're dealing with system-wide interconnected problems and there are problems hiding in plain sight. Too few tenure track jobs for PhDs, too slow pace of change of diversifying work and, and faculty, a gap between the enthusiasm for, uh, for say digital work or publicly engaged humanistic work and certainty about how to measure it well, how to measure its quality. Enrollments in some core humanities fields have dropped by 50% in some fields since the financial crisis of 2008-9. And in a world where anything before 1900 feels like ancient history, we really do fear for the, for the future of many foundational research projects. So with the urging of the Luce Foundation and with the support of the Luce Foundation, we convened in this experimental space, the design workshop to, divine, to, to design interventions and solutions to these problems. We knew, as is the case with genetically modified food, that there are always risks when you fiddle with complex systems. And we tried to be honest with ourselves about those risks. We are not looking with this, uh, with this effort to intervene from outside. We're really trying to work from within institutions. So we invited six teams, and you're gonna hear from representatives from five of them, made up of diverse voices from the academic side of the, of the university. We, we would have loved to include staff and undergraduates, we had to start somewhere. So we started on the academic side. 
graduate students, contingent faculty, tenured faculty, and an administrator. Every group had to include these constituents. We held four half day or all day meetings over two months and the groups met with, together with external participants uh, virtually every week during that span of time. The process was led by a wonderful design thinking expert, Elizabeth Peasley, I think she's in the audience today, um, in a neutral space where all the participants had to learn a new software. And my colleague, James Shulman will say a little bit about this in a moment. I'll say in closing, we tried to work outside the, or we were of course working outside the normal process of change um, or of operations in, in a college or a university. And we worked outside the usual hierarchy, but in every piece of our work, we tried to imagine ourselves within that space, understanding that big utopian projects about change are what we have our eye on, but we're only gonna get there if we go step-by-step step within the processes of an institution or to change those processes as they need to be changed. So now you're gonna hear more about the workshop and the pros and cons of our approach from James Shulman and uh, the team representatives. I'll just say in closing, um, we have over 150 people. So um, although you, you'll be able to see one another, we'll ask you to put your questions in the chat. Uh, please feel free to put your questions up as they come to mind. And we have a wonderful research assistant, Trevine Harris, who's going to look through the questions and she's going to read them out um, when we're finished with the presentations. So please feel free to use that chat. And now, James, over to you. Thank you, Trevine. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm James Shulman, I'm Vice President at ACLS, and I just want to give you a sense of, a little more sense of the process before we turn to our uh, team leaders. So I'm going to share my screen and show you the mural, one example of the mural whiteboard that we used, uh, that each team used throughout this process. And I won't even try to give you anything besides a sense of the scale of the work. As some of you have seen Mural, some of you have used it, as you can see, even from afar, uh, it consists of using yellow stickies and, uh, and various exercises. This is a bullseye di uh, uh, diagramming over here. Uh, we move to another exercise. Uh, what Mural allows you to do is you zoom in on different parts of this board. And you can see here that uh, one of the exercises was to create a poster that um, that uh, exemplified the change uh, that was being worked out by the team at one of the institutions. Then there's a critique of the poster where people would uh, would write on stickies and move them around. And uh, so it gives you a, just a general sense that this process over the course of four different Fridays um, uh, forced an enormous amount of work from the participants. Um, there were a lot of humanists involved. So as you can imagine, uh, sometimes uh, being uh, given 15 minutes or 30 minutes to uh, create something or to prioritize something, or in this case, to look at the relative import, uh, importance versus the relative difficulty of various projects uh, was not easy. There was uh, probably a little more inclination for uh, deliberation than, uh, than usually happens uh, in, a, in a mural process like this when it's being done uh, for a you know, sort of a strategic planning exercise in a, in a fast moving company. This um, this work though was really exciting. It was hard for people. It was hard to you know bot. There was bonding around the the challenges of using a new software, but there was also the excitement of being forced to produce and generate ideas, go through them, sift through them, and then uh, and then reconcile them into a project. Uh, I I think that the the other part that I'd emphasize as we go into our speakers is really that um, the the metaphor. That comes to mind is uh, is Stephen Jay Gould's uh, punctuated equilibrium, in the sense that these teams were not they weren't part of the normal process. And I guess the comparison between uh, million, hundreds of millions of years of evolution and change at an institutional basis probably um, is relevant in other ways. But it's really the punctuating of that uh, of that evolutionary process that we were trying to do. So as, as some of you know, and I, I vastly oversimplify. Uh, Gould's notion what is that uh, among certain populations who are geographically um, separated, a smaller population, change can take hold and a new stasis might be reached in a way that it can't happen in the bigger pool uh, of, 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 of a population. And that so that that geographically uh, isolated population with its, um, its uh, new stasis and its new set of change could then rejoin the population and and maybe that change takes hold. 
So I think what, what we're going to hear about today is really um, both about the idea generation and the, the content of the change that these teams worked on, but then also what happened when they came back. So again, this is these were sort of rump congresses. No one at the university said to said to these teams, please form and figure out a way to work on change. Uh, that was sort of an artificial intervention. And so then then what's happened as that's come back in and, and no one has delusions that change is gonna, that any of these changes are gonna happen instantly or take hold instantly, but it's just, we wanted to be, um, we collectively wanted to share that those experiences with you. So I'm gonna turn uh, to uh, the Dean of Humanities at UC Santa Cruz, uh, Jasmine Allender uh, to get us started. Thanks, James. Thanks, Joy. Hi, everyone. I'm gonna focus my comments a bit on the process as well of the design workshops. And I wanted to start by just acknowledging that as Joy did, that the word change has, um, I think particularly when it comes from the lips of a higher ed administrator can have multiple meanings. And myself, I came to Santa Cruz from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, where I was for, for almost 20 years. And I became very skeptical of change language um, at a place that had seen extraordinary budget cuts and the leadership really pushed us to change as if our institutions weren't in constant flux. Uh, so change in that context really came to signify loss. Change meant what can you do with less? You know, it masked the ideology of austerity and it really did feel like the be changed, the experience of being changed. So now I come to this, you know, at a new institution, a new state system, which thankfully gives me a different perspective on the notion and possibility of institutional change. And I think when it comes to particular institutional barriers, such as a broader definition of what counts as scholarship for tenure and promotion in the humanities, that's an issue that's well documented. It's research, there's white papers from professional organizations that are now decades old. So we have to take some responsibility for our reluctance to do the work necessary to operationalize the kinds of changes we know we need to make if we're committed to the work of building more inclusive institutions. So the design workshop set us up to take a more proactive and pragmatic approach to institutional change. As I said, each campus forms six member teams uh, made up of faculty, grad students from different departments, different backgrounds, and teams are also assigned to outside members to join us in our work. We had these very highly structured activities led by the endlessly patient Elizabeth Peasley, uh, who explained those exercises and managed our broad level of incompetence with that mural board that you just saw. That board became the place where we organized our ideas. Those initial sessions were in the problem space, and then later we moved to the solution space. The activities helped us narrow down those sets of problems, propose solutions, test them, and then pitch them to another team and eventually to campus colleagues. So I'd like to offer some of the pros and cons of this kind of process, starting with some advantages. First, I hold, my colleagues hold ECLS in very high esteem. And because they were initiating this effort, it made it a lot easier for team participants and upper administration on my campus to buy in. We took this on during the pandemic when faculty, staff, and students were all just doing our best to stay afloat. But the team really brought genuine enthusiasm to this work. And I think that really showed their interest in and hunger for this kind of activity. And for me as a new dean, the workshops were extremely helpful in finding and creating allies on the virtual campus I found myself in. The structure of the workshops fostered a collective approach to problem solving, but there are also challenges. Initially, it was overwhelming to figure out what balance to strike between tackling big structural issues and creating doable projects. However tempted I was to go after student debt and advocate for free college, some projects were clearly too big to take on in this design format. But I think maybe no project was too small. So that sort of suggested that the process would lend itself to more incremental approaches to change. Another challenge was the compressed timeframe. The workshops were highly structured and well choreographed, but those exercises left no time for overthinking. As academics, that was difficult because we love to overthink everything. And sometimes it felt like maybe we were underthinking things and whoever sort of got the last word in or the loudest word in in the Zoom room could shift our course and potentially derail us. We also never knew what was coming our way next. 
So we often left sessions somewhat confused about where we were heading. And I was eager to hear about what other campuses were doing and learn from them. Welcomed opportunities for sharing along with ways to increase the possibility of cross pollination. In the end, it became clear that while our projects were particular to our campuses, they aligned with shared concerns across institutions. So each team prototyped a plan to address a problem statement. My team's was the current faculty reward incentive and advancement structure does not adequately recognize forms of labor that campuses say they value, including DEI service, mentoring, and public scholarship. We then developed an idea for fostering collaboration across disciplines, ranks, and career stages with a focus on interdisciplinary teaching, research, and advising. The plan sought to activate a mutual mentoring dynamic for graduate students that would empower emerging scholars, legitimate public humanities methods, and reward mentoring. One particularly interesting strategy in the solution stage was the phrasing of the question, how might we? Might, for me, opened up receptivity to experiment in a way that, that could and should do not. So our team asked questions like, how might we revise faculty incentive structures and personnel process evaluation criteria to more adequately reward public scholarship? How might we build education that offers resources for first-generation students to pursue humanities fields? How might we more clearly integrate commitment to DEI and hiring and promotion? How might we make mentorship more valuable than gold? In the end, my team's work led not to one big project, but has infused multiple initiatives, laying the groundwork for the collaborative culture our design workshop plan cultivated and the design workshop itself instilled. So just a couple examples of the more incremental changes we're making this year. Uh, this winter, we announced the first call for public humanities digital and community engaged research fellowships to provide faculty in the humanities resources to pursue scholarly activity that brings their work to audiences beyond the university and for partnering with members of the public as collaborators. We're looking closely at barriers for associate professor to go to full working with faculty and department chairs to bring forward cases to promotion that are based on scholarly activity that's not a second monograph. And we were just awarded a National Endowment for the Humanities grant to support the creation of a humanities certificate targeted to engineering students. That project will involve bringing together a collaborative teaching community of faculty and graduate students this summer to use inclusive learning and teaching pedagogy to design five new gen ed courses that will serve as the certificate's core. So the process and experience of the design workshop have infiltrated our institutional planning, created momentum behind our efforts and a sense of connection at a time marked by isolation. So I will wrap up my comments there and turn things over to Amy Cook from Stony Brook. Great, thank you so much, uh, Jasmine, for the inspiration as well as um, the comrade camaraderie throughout this process and thanks to Joy and James um, as well. And I'd like to just also um, thank my, the team from Stony Brook who uh, along with me sort of showed up every Friday um, with from a number of different perspectives and, and really worked hard. Uh, Monica Bogayo, who's now the interim provost for Stony Brook, Celia Marshik, who is, was a previous chair of the English department, Adrian Wallace, uh, Mohamed Balan, Jimena Lopez Carrillo, and Abigail Nishimura. And the last two were actually grad students, so talk about um, underappreciated uh, labor. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit, uh, moving from the, the conversation of the process to a little bit of the process and a little bit of how we sort of dug through our challenge. We developed a plan to begin aligning faculty incentives and faculty assessment with the evolving and emerging range of university priorities. The goal is to drive change at the university by adapting these measures. And of course, as Joy pointed out, um, this is a well uh, trod territory and um, we are not the first to the fight, nor will we be the last. But the, the, the terrific thing about the workshop, about the process, was the way in which it slowed down our jump to solutions. Um, it's, it's easy to think that there is a clear solution or perhaps maybe that's my own um, weakness. But this process really 
slowed us down and, and forced us to look at a number of different challenges and how they related and what we wanted. Um, so for example, the, the how might we question um, was incredibly valuable to me and I still sort of return to it. Um, I was noticing the other day that one of the, the how might we statements were, was how might we imbue wellness into every element of the university committee community rather than just sort of letting it be something that psych services do um, and also expand it to um, faculty and administrators. And that's not the direction we went, but we came up with all of these different um, ideas and, and potential ways in which we could address a number of different problems. But ultimately through this deep exploration, we, we generated a map of the serious challenges facing our institution and higher ed as a whole, as well as potentials, as well as strengths. And um, we decided, we really felt that the faculty reward structure and particularly the assessment mechanism um, for promotion and tenure was at the core of, of many of these issues. So for example, one of the exercises um, that was particularly useful was the themes and insights exercise. And um, this allowed us to create stickies with just brief pieces of, of, of information um, about challenges and um, strengths and potential and to map them um, on the board and move them around as we saw fit and cluster them into groups. Uh, and then challenge those clusters and rearrange them again and draw lines. And then at the end of this um, categorization and, and movement, we were able to then put a, a, a sort of dialogue bubble on each of the clusters saying, um, what would this cluster say? Uh, and this was in, uh, particularly um, rich and generative to, to me and, and the rest of the team because it, it allowed us to sort of personify the, the character of the cluster and, and speak for it and, and listen to its response. So, um, but throughout this, we did feel like if we couldn't address how we were being assessed, then it was very hard to talk about um, a, a chat addressing diversity and addressing mentorship and certainly addressing questions about graduate education and, um, and a dissertation um, or wellness or any of these things. So many of the brilliant minds that have come before us have talked about this and, um, and we've been really inspired um, both throughout the workshop and, and since then by these leaders in the field, many of them who are on this call. Um, but so we kept asking what, what's holding back change? What do we need to make this happen? And I'm grateful to, to Jasmine for pointing out how scary change can be. Um, I sometimes uh, forget that. But what we realized is we wanted to look at what the assessment tool was. And um, Celia Marshik actually sort of brought to the, to the group the, the bio file, which is what it's called here, which is basically the form you fill out for promotion. Um, which structures the information that's asked for and the sort of uh, narrative or lack of narrative that that the candidate is given to to what they're what they're what they're going up for tenure or to promotion about. And it reminded me of a uh, Kathy Davidson quote. she she gave a talk at Stony Brook and she said, we cannot change structural inequality with goodwill. We must design new structures with equality at the core. And this struck me as, as really important because it is the structures that we have to take apart, that we have to look at, not just um, the, the sort of goodwill of, of many of us and the desire for change. Um, we have to acknowledge that the structures we have in place are meant to hold us to a, a previous century's um, desires for what education looks like. Um, and the biofile was just that structure because language shapes thinking. And if you talk about a stool, then there are three legs. If you talk about service, then it fails to distinguish between showing up to a committee meeting and developing deeply engaged community work. So we wanted to think about um, how might we alter the, the form to insist on 
a, a, the kind of community member that we actually wanted to have. We wanted to figure out how do we change this from a document that basically asks to, to slot in so that we can add up into some sort of equation um, the, the sort of highlights from your publishing career um, and to actually think about it more as how are you telling the story of who you are and the contribution you're making to the community, to the external community, um, to the values of the university, such as um, mentorship and diversity, equity, and inclusion, and public engagement, and, and creating and disseminating new knowledge. And so we sort of played with different words and we, we sort of reorganized or, or imagined or reorganized Biofile. We got tremendously terrific feedback, both from other of the teams um, and, and also from um, leaders at, at our institution. Where do we go from here? What will it look like to actually make, make progress on this? And um, one of the things that I've recognized is that it takes a recognition that we don't really, I'm not sure we all agree on what the problem is. Um, I think everyone seems to know that we need to change the promotion and tenure process, but it seems to me that many people think that we need to change it to make it harder. Um, and some people think we need to change it by getting rid of it. Um, and some people think we need to change it to streamline it or make it less labor intensive. Um, and I don't, I mean, my point is more, we need to start having conversations to at least sort of agree as to what is the change that needs to happen and at least acknowledge that our current structures um, do not reflect um, our values. They simply allow us to um, measure, um, to value what we measure instead of me value, measuring what we value, uh, as my dean would say. Um, so we have, we have begun conversations um, and I know there's real interest in, in doing this at the university level, but as Joy pointed out, this is a national effort, uh, not just a Stony Brook effort. So it's going to, to take some time and it's also gonna take some really difficult conversations about what is the, what is the um, not just how do we raise the bar higher and higher, but what is the nature of the bar and what, who is it keeping out? Um, I like to joke that, um, you know, I, I really, I found promote, promotion and tenure, though stressful, not, challenge, not terribly difficult. It worked perfectly well for me. The problem is we don't want to tenure more people like me necessarily. We need to change the kind of people um, and diversify the kind of people that are at our institutions. And we need to change the structures that are keeping them from that. So with that, I'm sure I talked a mile in a minute and I don't know whether I went over my time or under my time, but I'll pass it uh, to, to Kit. Uh, thank you, Amy. Uh, so I'm uh, Kit Wellman from Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, and for us, the design workshop performed three vital functions. Uh, first, it was a catalyst. This was during a time when we otherwise would have been concerned exclusively with responding to the latest COVID news. Uh, this opportunity forced us to get together and to think boldly about changes that we proactively wanted to make. Uh, second, thanks to Elizabeth, we were forced to focus ruthlessly on a single realistic goal. Uh, and third, it shouldn't be underestimated that the ACLS carries a great deal of weight. So once we uh, fastened upon our goal, we were able to go back to our campus under the banner of this design workshop, uh, able to say that we had an important mission. So what was our mission? Uh, we were concerned uh, that at Washington University, we in the humanities have historically been in the grips of a fierce book fetish. So all dissertations have to be proto books uh, and it's widely uh, believed that no one can go up for tenure without writing one book and making progress on a second. And of course, uh, you can't go up for promotion to full without having written at least a second book. Uh, and so we wanted uh, to move to a much more pluralistic understanding of achievement and excellence in the humanities. 
Uh, this isn't to denigrate the book. There's nothing wrong with the book. We don't want to replace that. We want to add to it to make room for, among other things, more public facing scholarship, uh, which could be seen as a substitute rather than just a supplement uh, to the monographs. Uh, the good news is that uh, our colleagues, both on the faculty and the, in the administration, have been largely receptive to this idea. Uh, and in fact, uh, the dean of our college has written a statement uh, and has called a meeting for all of the chairs of the humanities departments for next week, at which he is going to explain that uh, from the college's perspective, there is no department where a book is required for promotion or tenure. Uh, and that from the college's perspective, without relaxing the standards, uh, if anything, we want to increase the standards for excellence, uh, we are embracing a more pluralistic understanding of, um, of what that excellence might look like. So that's the good news. If nothing else, uh, the design workshop has meant that the humanists at Washington University are formally liberated uh, from uh, this almost exclusive focus on the monograph. Uh, but I must admit there are still uh, some pockets of resistance. And, and when we got back to campus, we talked to each of uh, the heads of all of the departments and there were at least four uh, types of reluctance. Uh, in one case, a chair said that while he acknowledged that the second book wouldn't necessarily be required for promotion of full professor, he did still believe that one, the first book would be required for tenure. Second, uh, a couple of our more newly minted departments, these are not traditional humanities departments like history and English, but a couple of our programs that have only recently become uh, departments uh, expressed that they did not want to lean into this initiative if the more traditional disciplines didn't, because they feared that on the campus they would be regarded not just as different, but as uh, less uh, demanding. Um, and uh, similarly, uh, at least one of our departments has uh, expressed that they're not in the top 30, say, their PhD program is not in the top 30 nationally. Uh, and they would be reluctant to uh, publicly endorse this if they felt like the, the top 10 departments were more traditional, because again, they would uh, be seen as uh, relaxing their standards. Uh, and then finally, uh, one chair who, um, to put it bluntly, feels as though she's been burned a couple of times uh, by the college committee uh, denying uh, perfectly uh, good candidates for tenure explained that as long as she's chair, she's gonna counsel her uh, junior faculty very conservatively. Uh, and so she's gonna say, you know, no matter what the Dean says, make sure you've got a book with a top flight press. So we've got some work to do. Um, and what we're hoping is that after this meeting next week, we can identify some departments, um, uh, as many as possible who are willing to rewrite their tenure and promotion documents uh, and uh, to really think uh, very ambitiously about uh, leaning into a more pluralistic understanding of excellence. And this is uh, where we're hoping that we can continue to lean on the ACLS. Uh, so if uh, we expect that's, that there will be pockets of resistance in some of these departments, and it might be really helpful uh, if the ACLS can um, bring in some of the, learn, the rele uh, relevant learned societies or other people uh, in the discipline who have clearly have standing as leaders uh, to explain that um, uh, we're not outliers here and that uh, this is the type of thing that uh, needs to occur and, and that there's a great deal of support for it. So um, yeah, so we're just very grateful uh, to have been included in this. Uh, it's something that there's no way we would have undertaken uh, had we not been uh, uh, invited and then poked and prodded. Uh, we've made some progress and we're, we're hopeful that uh, we can uh, not just make some on paper changes, but really change the culture um, at Washington University. So I'll turn it over now to Maria at William & Mary. Thanks so much, Kit. Um, so yeah, so I am Maria Donahue-Valeca and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at William & Mary. 
And I began in this position um, in June of 2020, uh, right when we were in, in the, the very early stages of trying to figure out how to deal with this pandemic. And so for me, um, I was really trying to learn so much about a new community and being welcomed into the Luce and ACLS uh, fellowship gave me this opportunity to think about change at a, at a time um, that, that was really terrific. Now, I should say that I, I came from a previous institution, Georgetown, where we had a big center for learning and scholarship and loved design thinking workshops. And I always loved doing them, except that I, I sort of developed an aversion to seeing post-it notes on, on white sheets of paper. Um, and, and so moving into an electronic version of this was actually a, a really interesting um, experience. And I, and I do have to say that the ineptitude was really stunning for a bunch of highly educated people, but, um, but, but super fun and funny too. Um, I loved being part of ACLS and the loose sponsorship. Um, I think it brought a lot of um, importance to us uh, on, our, on our campus. And I was really glad to have worked with the other universities. So really important. And I think that, you know, for all of us during this time when there's so many things that were going on, on our own campuses and you know should we have classes in person or you know how are faculty and, and staff feeling about uh, their own safety knowing that we could do this and we could do it good enough that it, it wasn't going to be perfect um, and uh, and and so that was just knowing we were moving forward a little bit on key priorities was really important so I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Um, like the other uh, schools, we assembled a team and, and what we did was brought together um, two tenured um, faculty in dance and art and art history, a brand new um, Hispanic studies um, uh, assistant professor who I had one month on in our position so I, I, I could tell him how things were um, going at William Mary. Uh, a non-tenure eligible faculty member in linguistics and English and a doctoral student in history. And I have to say that that for me too, as a new Dean, bringing this group together was um, life-saving. It really was. And it is reminding me that I need to gather this group back together because it's been a while since we've, we've gotten together. Um, what was fascinating for me is um, how much our priorities and interest um, overlapped between the, the different universities. So our sort of priorities in the very beginning fell into three broad categories. So the first is recognizing faculty work. And so that is sort of how do we award innovation? How do we encourage risk? How do we think about scholarship and merit um, reimagined? And you've heard some of these already in the other groups, which is uh, terrific. Um, we also were really interested in promoting community-based partnerships and community-based learning. Um, but what our group really settled on was um, how do we create a humanities hub or human humanities and um, humanistic social science hub? And how do we create a place where change is encouraged um, on our campus. And so that is what our group settled on. Now, I'll tell you a little bit about William and Mary. So um, it is uh, formally called the College of William and Mary. However, it is a research university. Um, it is an old place. It's the second oldest university in the country and it's a public university. Um, not everybody knows that. Um, we are really, really proud of our liberal arts tradition. Um, we have really good enrollments in our humanities majors and minors, and we, we have lots of credit hours. And we've been really um, uh, lucky that we have lots of student interest and, and don't have a lot of issues with enrollment. But what struck me is we, we always say that we are so proud of this tradition. And then what do we show to our board of visitors? So today I was with our board of visitors and what we talked about was computer science. Um, when we wanted to you know, put screens behind us on backdrops, um, it's the entrepreneurship center um, you know, through the business school that is on you know, the president's backdrop. Um, you know, or when we take tours around, we start with our brand new, you know, shiny science buildings. And, and so that's not to say science is bad. I am a scientist myself. And Joy, I was so happy to hear you say molecule in this setting. Um, but, uh, but, you know, but it is also, um, I was drawn to this work because of uh, the liberal arts tradition. So 
what we thought we could do at William Mary is really name the value of uh, the humanities and humanistic social sciences, and that we could frame them as as relevant and sophisticated and modern as any of the other courses of study um, within our university. Uh, so fortunately for me and for us on the um, on the team, uh, William Mary was in the middle of a strategic planning process that had been halted during pandemic that we picked up this year. And what we did was we opted for a five year strategic plan um, and it is called Vision 2026. And that's important because Williamsburg, um, you probably all know was the capital of the colony of Virginia. Um, and that 2026 is the semi-quincentennial of um, our country and of American democracy. And so we are taking this as an opportunity uh, to remember our role in that process. So what we um, have now placed into our strategic plan at William & Mary is the creation of a humanistic, um, uh, human, humanities and, and humanistic social science hub. Um, we intend to engage donors, and I should say that William & Mary um, uh, donors are, are really generous. We just closed a billion dollar campaign and we'll be beginning a new one. Um, uh, that we imagine uh, a brick and mortar um, proud uh, place where we can celebrate our humanities traditions, um, where there will be faculty residencies and grants for innovative work, where graduate student and undergraduates will be working. And, and so um, it's sort of returning to the, to the, to the founding of um, our, our university's ideals, and we are really looking forward to this. So I will now turn this over to Ari um, from UC Davis. Thanks, Maria. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to talk very quickly uh, and briefly about uh, the beginning of our process. But before doing that, I want to just say thanks to ACLS. Uh, this was a really wonderful opportunity for uh, the College of Letters and Science. Um, we got quite a lot out of it. Um, reiterating some of the points that others have made, uh, one of the first things that we tried to think about at the time was uh, structural constraints. We are an intensely decentralized campus uh, with very robust shared governance, um, which I say, even though at the time I was serving as interim dean, I say that uh, it's one of our great strengths. Um, and uh, as a consequence, we tried to think about a way that we could empower a, a unit that had particular traits uh, to engage in, in these activities um, and then possibly to come up with proof of concept, which would then, um, in, in an ideal scenario, uh, allow other units to uh, imagine that they might want to join. Um, and so uh, I, I looked to our Department of English for a number of different reasons. The first of which uh, is that it's an exceptionally diverse unit and large enough that it has people who could do this kind of work uh, who were not so overburdened um, with other service obligations uh, that they wouldn't be able to step up. Uh, second of all, because it's an extraordinarily diverse unit, as I said, um, and that it could represent uh, the college more broadly. And then finally, because it had outstanding leadership at the time, uh, both an excellent chair in that moment um, and a really uh, wonderful rising chair, uh, Claire Waters, which is um, the perfect opportunity for me to pivot now uh, and introduce Claire, who will talk about um, exactly the sort of activities in which we engaged. Again, uh, thanks to ACLS and to all of you. Thanks, Sorry, um, and I'll just second that. Um, this was a great a great experience for our team, um, which consisted of um, me. I was not the chair at the time. I'm the I've, I've since come in as chair, um, but I was working with our then graduate advisor Desiree Martin, um, our colleague Matthew Vernon, and an advanced graduate student Yasmin Hachimi. Um, and we, like everyone else, really benefited from hearing from all the teams. Um, that was a really great part of the process, and also from our two the two outside members of our team with whom we worked the most. Um, Closely, Tim Eatman and Jeff Dolben. Um, that was a that was a really valuable part of the experience to have people in that small close conversation that we had, um, who came from other institutions and brought other perspectives. So the the big challenge I'm going to talk about our challenge and the sort of um, first steps that we've taken on it. The challenge that we came to um, using the murals process was a dual one that um, to sort of pick up something that Joy said earlier. Um, it had to do with our sense that uh, 
we needed to try to make humanities scholarship more sustainable, um, both individually and societally. That is, the two problems that emerged the most strongly from our process were um, faculty and graduate students, and I think undergraduates as well, um, likely feeling, um, and this is surely partly due to the pandemic, but not exclusively, um, feeling drained, tired, having a hard time finding the joy in the work that they knew was there and that got them in in the first place, um, but thinking about what would help um, help us all hold on to that. And then seemingly unrelatedly, but we came to think not unrelatedly, um, the problem of how to reach larger constituencies as effectively as we could, local, regional, national, um, and for us as a state university, perhaps especially uh, state level, um, that is how to translate our work better. Um, those are huge problems. Um, uh, and the thing that we came to realize um, as we tried to think about how to tackle them in any kind of pragmatic way, um, and as we looked at our map of constituents, um, people who might have an interest, a vested interest in the problems we were looking at, um, was that graduate students seemed really to be the linchpin, um, the group that was um, at the heart of a lot of these problems, it seemed to us. The current state of the job market in the humanities, of course, means that many, many grad students will work outside of academia, um, and so are looking toward that and thinking about that, um, even as they pursue academic work, and many of them also continue to um, move into academic positions. Um, so we've been trying in a lot of ways to support graduate students uh, as they look at a range of possible work. Um, and one of the things that this process helped us realize that was that we could help both with the question of sort of sustainability of work um, and we hoped with the question of finding positions that are rewarding by helping grad students think about how to integrate their work on campus with who they were in a more complete way um, off of campus. Their, the skills, the experiences they brought, the expertise, perhaps the previous work that they'd done, um, their, their interests, their hobbies, all of the ways in which those things are connected to academic work and could, better, could use better um, representation. So um, we came up with three things that we thought we might want to pursue. One was strengthening our links to and communication with um, our local and regional communities, perhaps through team teaching or workshops. That one we're still working on. There are departments on campus doing a really great job with that um, that we are hoping to sort of learn from. Um, but it's complicated, particularly team teaching uh, has resource constraints, as we all know. Um, Another piece which we have started working on is openness to varied forms of dissertations, um, which is uh, sort of related, I think, to the question of connecting different kinds of work that people do. Um, but the piece that we chose, the sort of project piece that we chose to focus on and move ahead with was the project of helping, giving graduate students a very structured, scaffolded, supported way to think through their own professional profiles, interests, goals and um, create personal websites that they would be able to take with them um, when they leave Davis that would help represent them in the fullest way and therefore we hope help them find work that they'll find fulfilling. Um, the thing that is helpful for us that was helpful for us about this project was that um, it both seemed to address a lot of the central concerns we had that is uh, recognizing and honoring diversity of experience and the different things that people bring to an academic community and then bring from an academic community back out to the world, um, thinking in very pragmatic ways about what kinds of support we give to graduate students um, looking at the job market, and the fact that this um, project potentially um, links up with a campus-wide project that is about better supporting better career outcomes for undergraduates and graduate students, um, so that, for instance, if we get a good version of that, of this project. It's something that we could share both with other graduate departments, but perhaps also with that project, which is called Aggie Launch. Um, and possibly also something that'll be of interest and use to faculty. But what we're working on specifically is creating a four, four workshop sequence where graduate students will get clear support and guidance about how they want to create their professional profile, what they want that to look like, um, and then we'll be helped to think about what platforms might support that, and then actually build the, put their sites together and learn how to keep up with them um, in a way that does not eat into their time extensively, right? That isn't a sort of project that's gonna have a lot of creep out into their other work, um, but that will be bounded. Um, 
And the hope is that the process of this, as well as the products, will be valuable to them, um, that different people might take different things away from it. Um, and it will be a pilot project this year. But uh, if it works well, we're hoping to carry it on in future years and also, as I say, to share it with other departments. Um, so I'll stop there and hand back over to Joy. Thank you, Claire. Um, and I want to thank everybody, all the presenters. We're, we're now, and now it's time for me to remind you all to put your questions in the chat. Um, and we, as, as we're waiting for you to, to um, think through your questions, I want to, I want to mention uh, or, or say something about the, the thread that I, that runs for me through all these presentations, through the work of the teams and the external participants who joined the team, weren't part of the schools, that um, what, I, what I felt in every day of the design workshop, that at the heart of it, what was going on were that th this is a bunch of incredibly smart people with diverse experiences at different stages of career, all coming at the problem of, you know, what is a scholar? And in our diversity, plurality as people, all the things we bring to, uh, you know, the desires, the skills, the talents, all the things we bring to the work of scholarship, um, how, is, how can we crack open the system in ways that better recognize that plurality and, and then allow people to exert their, their, um, their, their humanistic knowledge as action in the world, whether that be you know, in a community engaged scholarly project that increases, you know, the, one of whose outputs is increasing voting levels in a particular town, or whether that's involved in, in researching um, a forgotten corner of, uh, of, of, of history in the global South that increases global knowledge and understanding and sparks people's curiosity uh, about, um, about others, you know, with a capital O. I mean, in all those ways, um, from the more traditional and familiar to the really experimental um, to, uh, you know, to, to things we are only just beginning to imagine, many of us being, especially the emerging generation, that was the thread, you know, how do we, uh, open up this system, which is accreted in so many ways over the over the decades, to support and and make scholarship almost into a fortress. You know, very solid, um, difficult to tear down. Now we have to we have to keep the fortress like element, but uh, in in the sense of defending and advocating what we do, but um, but make it uh, more bendy uh, and more more uh, more plural in recognizing the different ways in which humanists act in the world, um, undertaking their inquiry in the world. So um, now seeing here, if we have, we, we seem to have convinced everyone with our, <laughs> with our questions, but, um, but uh, Trevine, I hand it over to you. Thanks, Joy. Um, we have a question coming in from Edward Lebo for Ari and Claire at UC Davis. The focus on the students is intriguing and consistent with some of the other teams focus on assessment mechanisms. I'm curious as to whether you explore the possibility of how we might redefine our notion of success so that graduate admissions committees committees have a more capacious view of prospective students. I'll take that if I may and um, Ari can follow if he likes. Um, that is a great question for us. One of the reasons that it was incredibly helpful to have Desiree Martin on the committee was that she had been doing work for a number of years um, with a project called Amiga about diversifying graduate admissions um, and thinking about how to recognize, um, among other things, one of the, the pieces we look at is the distance students have traveled to get where they are um, in their education and in their interests. Um, and she had been very successful in beginning to um, uh, Diversify the the teams. Um, sorry, the the cohorts that were that were coming in, um, uh, and we're we're already benefiting from that. So, this is in some ways. I, I I hope that the project that we're working on in some ways looks both ways. That's one of the reasons that we do want to represent more fully who our students are. Um, Ari, I don't know if you want to add anything. Uh, I was going to say uh, much of what you just said about Des, uh, about Desiree. Um, I would only just, I suppose, add one other thing, which is that uh, while I was serving as dean, as I mentioned already, I was always keenly aware of the importance of shared governance. And it's, it's really not the dean's office's place other than to be very, very uh, gently suggestive about the ways in which 
admissions committees might try and reimagine um, what makes a candidate qualified or not for admission, um, because that falls squarely within the province of the faculty. But we've we've done a lot of work on the campus uh, around this issue um, and uh, using what I guess you might call soft power um, to to try and bring people into the fold. And and Des is one of the exemplars I think who's done some of this work. Uh, in, in all sorts of really outstanding ways. Thank you. Um, we have another question from um, David Scobie. The team process sounds great, bravo. I wonder what the implications are supporting a robust vision of scholarship for one, contract non-tenure stream faculty, um, which are now a huge part of, a huge proportion of full-time faculty and faculty in comprehensive teaching universities with heavy teaching expectations of research, but not a book and a half. So how do these things um, coincide with um, how we're reimagining scholarship for non tenure stream faculty or for faculty with heavy teaching loads? And I can say a little bit about what's happening right now in the University of California system and my colleagues at Davis can also um, correct me, but our uh, non tenure stream faculty, uh, our lecturers are represented and just negotiated a new contract and that new contract um, it includes salary increases, but also um, a much different way of uh, thinking about appointments and appointments that have to be for longer periods of time. So after one year, then it follows up by a two year appointment and a three year appointment. And part of that contract also includes uh, a, a pool of research funds. Research is not usually a part of the official workload, but there you know, are plenty of um, non-tenure stream faculty who are interested in, in carrying on their research activity. And so now there's a, a fund that's dedicated to supporting um, their research um, and we'll see how that goes. And for the second question, we also have um, come up with a, a teaching professor a title and job description that is also ladder rank. There's Senate faculty here, it used to be called, sometimes still is lecture with security of employment. So there's assistant teaching professor, you go through a tenure and promotion process that is the same as I guess what you call ladder rank faculty, uh, but much more emphasis on teaching and on pedagogy and much smaller emphasis on research. If I could jump in here, I'm, I'm hoping um, to see with this particular piece of our conversations, um, uh, you know, picking up on, on things Jasmine was saying, um, a more robust uptake and embrace of multiple forms of scholarship. And that's this, the question really makes concrete kind of abstract comments I was making about plurality and diversity. I think one of the, the the elephant, I mean, there's an elephant in the room always in academia of, of the, you know, the really what I've called in writing brutal hierarchy of the system where um, a lot of scholars, even if they find themselves working in conditions like David mentions, still look to a kind of gold ring um, of, of scholarly production that's really only feasible and sometimes barely that in universities that are really well resourced with low teaching loads and you know heavy emphasis on the production of highly specialized peer reviews scholarship that it's that hierarchy that is is so difficult when people feel uncomfortable talking about it i think even and so um so trying to embrace and lift up work that doesn't fit into um you know work, work maybe produced at well-resourced universities but that doesn't fit the traditional model seems to me a really crucial part of um of empowering legitimating lifting up recognizing awarding work that's produced under you know different working conditions uh, so that you know we're not dealing with a, a kind of um, a ranked implicitly or explicitly you know um uh, what's the word I'm looking for, kind of insidious ranking of types of work, if that makes sense. Can I jump in real to yeah. add to that? Um, I, I think as uh, David Scobie is saying in the chat as well, um, that part of what we need to do in rethinking faculty reward structure is rewarding um, more of us in different ways and different um, sort of spreading it around. So I, I think that we need to acknowledge the crucial importance um, that uh, 
a variety of different roles on campus play and not just spend our time thinking about what is the, the top ring that you have to sort of jump through, um, but rather thinking about the community as a d diverse group of interdisciplinary and um, multi-talented um, community members um, that, that, can, that can serve the advancement of knowledge and the advancement of teaching and the advancement of the public good in a, in a variety of ways and, and from a different, a number of different perspectives. So that it's not just, we only attend to how we reward tenure track faculty, but we need to think more broadly about who is it that makes up our community. Thank you. Uh, there is a uh, question from Tamara Metz um, to everyone, and this one is focused on the transitioning from design thinking in the workshop into the real world, right? So she would love to hear a bit more about the strategies for actually making change happen in the context of shared governance. I'll just say by way of introduction, like while my colleagues are thinking it, that that question was really crucially important, important because of our emphasis on realism and wanting to get things done um, in the context of, you know, of, um, of identifying committees uh, and, and getting in, I'll, I'll put it this way, um, because I'm a person who specializes in Roman literature and culture, I can't help thinking of Julius Caesar and it's a horrible militaristic metaphor, but you know, the sending out the troops in all directions and circling everyone around so that people are essentially surrounded by, um, by good ideas that are positive, that are constructive, that are inclusive. Um, and when I say everyone, I really mean everyone from the provost and the president and the board of trustees down to um, faculty or over to, I should say, faculty and promotion and tenure committees. But I'll let my colleagues speak to the uh, question of governance. Well, I'll just say um, we presented our work to um, the president of the Senate. Um, and this is this was not one of, we presented to um, other members of the upper administration and he was actually perhaps the most critical and, and change reverse. Um, and so part of what I meant by saying the slowing down of the process was really valuable to us is that looking at it from a number of different perspectives, what does this process mean um, on our particular campus, which is very unionized and, and um, invested in shared governance, um, and, and, but also what does it look like from, from, you know, what do we need to do to convince the upper administration to, to call for such a change? So, um, but it has been slow for, for that reason. Um, it, it does require, uh, as Joy said, uh, deployment on all fronts. I'll just say quickly, um, the, place that I think about this is the project that I mentioned, the um, ID launch project to talk about sort of um, improved career and experiential education for, for all students. And one of the things that we've been realizing is that um, uh, it's going to rely a lot on um, particular personal relationships and talking to people that you know and figuring out who would be on board with a particular initiative and, and who's willing to kind of show up for that. Um, that's kind of coming from the faculty side, but also going out to the faculty side, um, particularly with initiatives that might, um, as Kit was talking about, face resistance um, or, or raise questions um, so that you hear what the concerns are up front. We, we've been, there have been a certain number of suggestions of sending surveys, right? Um, but you, everybody gets very tired of surveys and you don't really get the, sense of who is out there um, who does care about this and would be willing to help. So um, it's a very old fashioned answer, but I think that that's sort of where we've ended up. And I'll just um, follow up on that, which is that I'm always struck that each institution has its own sort of governance structure. Um, William Mary is a place that still has monthly full faculty meetings um, and Zoom has really helped that. So there's lots of participation. Um, I think taking the time to talk through different ideas with lots of different stakeholders. So we have, you know, official shared governance. We have our academic leaders of chairs and program directors 
you know, and, and I actually think that in our case, being part of ACLS and, and the loose um, change program really helped us. And um, our president was on board uh, right, you know, early on. And so as we were going through our strategic planning and we talked about, you know, we, we asked people to give us lots of ideas um, and, and I submitted this one as one of the possibilities. It was really great to see that the faculty decided um, that this was a priority of theirs too. So um, it, it, shared governance takes time. And if, if you do it right, it's, it's really worthwhile. Everyone comes out the other side believing this is uh, the right path. One other aspect, if I may, is that um, while the governance of any one institution is, is a thing in, in and of itself, and it does depend on personal relationships and, and institutional memory and history, um, the establishment of norms on the horizontal layers across the sector are, are, are very powerful. Um, and uh, we, we had one incident where we followed up with the individuals who participated with the teams, and Joy and I met with all of them to uh, hear what they, uh, what they thought about the experience. And it was really interesting because one of the uh, visitors mentioned that when she got back to her campus and she was having a meeting with the provost about something, uh, they were talking about a particular new direction. And she said, well, I, you know, I hear that Wash U and Pitt are thinking about this, but you know, I mean, who knows? And of course the provost said, oh, well, that's interesting. I didn't realize. So that legitimacy is gained uh, through that kind of uh, norm setting across uh, people in roles across the, the societies, which of course many of the academic societies have meetings of uh, department chairs. And so that sort of, um, that sort of we're in this together and this kind of work is okay is, is, uh, is more important for affecting local thought than, than we might've known. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have anything else to add for that question? Okay, to go. Okay, I have another question from Bonoit. As you pursue this research as a team, was there particular attention paid to issues of race, gender, and their intersection, and their impact on access to higher education and tenure? So questions of diversity around higher education access and tenure. I'll just say briefly, um, that I think was really central actually to the conversations we had. It may not have been as explicit in what I was saying, but um, particularly because we have admitted more diverse grad cohorts, people with different kinds of experiences coming in. Um, the project that we undertook both wanted to recognize the particular strains that people are under um, for different, you know, from different life experiences or different situations. Um, all grad students, I think, are living under a lot of strain at present, um, and that's intensified by various um, uh, positionalities. Uh, and the, one of the things that this project wanted to do was, was to give, um, sort of fill in whatever blanks or gaps anyone had, right? Um, people come in with different abilities or comfort with um, self-presentation and websites and all kinds of practical and, and other matters. Um, and so we were, really wanted to um, give, to sort of meet our students where they are and provide the support in an interactive way so that they can show, showcase um, everything that they're so great about, that's so great about them um, in a more full way. Yeah, and I would say that it was central to all of our conversations. Um, and in fact, you know, so much of what, of what we felt were the challenges facing higher education is, um, that we need to, um, there are a lot of problems within and outside of higher uh, education that need solving right now. And we're not gonna solve them with the, with the systems of the past. So, um, so that the whole, for me and for the team, uh, the question of how do we move forward demanded um, deep engagement with questions of race and, um, and gender and, and access and questions of, you know, who are the bodies in the room um, engaging the, these critical questions and how can we increase access um, and increase interdisciplinarity um, in a variety of ways in order to improve the answers that we're offering up to society. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question that's um, around, I guess, risk appetites and relatively risk assessment for everyone, whoever wants to jump in. 
thanks to all the groups for sharing their thought provoking findings. One of the barriers that seems connected to all the presentations but was not named was risk and faculty and units risk appetite. With the scarce resources of the humanities, risk taking and change implementation are ever present. Kit Wellman's comments mentioned such ideas of risk. I'm wondering what reflections your group had about risk as a barrier. And this is from Andrew Nestingen. So what reflections each group had about risk as a barrier to implementation of the ideas that came up in the workshop? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just start as, you know, as a scientist, what I'm always reminded of is uh, the experiments that we do in research laboratory settings usually don't succeed. And you learn so much from why it didn't work. Um, and, and so if that's okay for scientists, right? That, you know, like 30% of what we do um, gives us the experiment, asks the question we thought and we get a meaningful answer. Why isn't that okay for the humanities too? Experimentation is uh, in, present in lots of different disciplines. And I was just with a music faculty member who, who said, you know, when I compose something and it's not great, I learn a lot about why it wasn't great. So I think that the way to, and this is, uh, there was a, a, a more targeted question for me is that, you know, scholarship is scholarship and being a serious thinker and asking hard questions is our business. And, um, and I think that we, we shouldn't hold different standards that, you know, that humanities research has to be meaningful, right? And, um, you know, so much of the, of the, the work in um, STEM is, you know, you're shooting in the dark. And, and, and so that's, that's sort of this risk. So I would say, um, you know, we need to be proud of that tradition and we need to encourage people to do things that may or may not give answers, um, but they'll learn a lot. So I'll, I'll jump in having been singled out um, here. I think that risk is in, an incredibly important um, question when it comes to uh, tenure and promotion. So we can say, uh, and we can write on paper that you can get tenure by doing something that no one else has gotten tenure doing. Um, but if, if you get a, a tenure track position, that's like winning the lottery. And I wouldn't blame anyone for being risk averse uh, and thinking, well, yeah, maybe I'll be more pluralistic post tenure, right? And so I, and I could also imagine department chairs saying, you know, I don't want to mess around with somebody's life. And uh, I believe what she's doing is great stuff. And I would certainly want to tenure her. But if I can't be sure that it's going to get through the college committee and the dean, Right. I can't in good conscience tell her, oh, forget what your predecessors have done. Do this stuff, which I this public facing stuff, which I think is extremely important. So I think we need to be mindful of that. And we need to understand this is why um, I emphasized that uh, as, as excited as we are to get the dean's approval and to have these meetings, this is just the beginning and we need a cultural shift. Um, and until it becomes more pervasive. It's gonna be very risky, but I'll just, I'll close with this, right? Uh, no one is requiring that someone take these risks. The point is that they are allowed uh, to take these risks and the hope that the risk, the hope is that over time, as we change the culture and as other schools uh, follow, um, that it'll be, it'll be and be seen as less risky. I would say that, you know, we talked a lot about the risk um, that we take if we don't make significant changes. And I think that, you know, people, uh, or at least um, faculty have been feeling, you know, the weight of the demands on them. And if we don't start to do things that really adequately recognize the, the contributions that they make across categories, whether it's, um, the, the three legs of the stool or something that's more pluralistic uh, that we're gonna lose, we're gonna lose faculty. We have, you know, um, the potential for real retention issues. I will say, however, that when it came to risk, um, Kit, you were a lot more willing to undertake 
risk than we were when it came to tenure and promotion because we we were thinking that starting with promotion from associate to full, um, we see a lot of I would say overserviced associates who are you know in a sense having a very hard time figuring out a pathway to promotion. That that seemed a place where the risk uh, was easier to manage than going straight to the assistant professor with tenure route. Thanks, Jasmine. Um, I have a question here from Suzanne is it Hagedorn. It's related to the, the, in the first question that was asked um, initially about this um, idea of shifts in the labor market, right? So particularly concerning adjunctification, um, asking about the, if, if you could, if any of you could discuss the issue of adjunctification of the humanities on your campus, and I'm assuming how it relates to these questions of, um, uh, changes in, in tenure and promotion guidelines, uh, different uh, ways to produce a dissertation or um, work for tenure and so on. How does this factor in? And I think, I forget who it was from UC had mentioned changes in labor structures or contracts, negotiation and so on. But I think Suzanne probably wants some more input from anybody else who might have different views related to their campus activity. Let me jump in for a second while my colleagues think. the. Um... I, I come at this question slightly differently, and so I'm not quite, um, with apologies, I'm not quite answering the adjunctification question, but rather the conditions uh, that, that you alluded to in your question of, of tenured faculty or, or tenure line faculty not being replaced with tenure line faculty, but with um, part-time adjunct contingent faculty. Um, one of the reasons that this happens, and I, I think it's the main reason I'd be really interested to hear other people say that's not that's not the right reason, but my best take on why this is happening is, is enrollment drops. Um, it's, of course, not happening in every field in every department, um, but um, but certainly when I was a dean at NYU, it was, uh, um, I luckily had great colleagues in the in dean's in, in the social sciences and the sciences who who valued the humanities and you know who didn't um, like sharks you know um, eat up every faculty line but in all honesty given where the students were going with their feet they could have done that because the people were beating down the doors in biology and um, and uh, and the health sciences more generally in computer science um, and in uh, in economics uh, and so if we had if we had followed the vote of the students' feet, that's where all the faculty lines would have had to go. Um, it, it, as I say, you know, we had a more balanced approach to enrollment management, and we had the financial capability of doing that. But that, for me, the uh, the challenge of you know how do we how do we change reward structures so that they um, they acknowledge the incredibly hard work that faculty do these days to capture students' attention, capture their presence in classes, capture their decision to major, is it's a big part of the issue. And, and so, Joy, I'll follow up for, after you because Suzanne is a member of, of, of my faculty, and, and so it's, it's, um, it's a question that um, we talk about a lot. So I'm just of the belief that we don't design complicated academic structures based upon what an 18 year old thinks is interesting at the moment. And that we have uh, standards of what liberal arts means to us, what a broad and complex community is, and then we, um, we hire to that goal. The one thing that I, I have tried to say is that for me as a Dean, replacement is not a great word, right? So instead, what I want to hear is, you know, in your department, what are the the um, the foci that need to be represented for you to be a serious and um, productive department? And then we hire to those needs, not the fact that there happened to have been a person in a position in that department in the past. And so really uh, looking at this, not just based on enrollment, but on critical skills and, um, and expertise that we want represented in our community. Um, and, you know, I, I think that really talking to the faculty and saying, so what would be the right composition in, in your uh, department or program, and then, and then working with them to, to, to meet those needs. And I, I would say um, this goes back to the sort of flip side of risk that if there are certain risks that if we don't take, um, the risk is much greater. Um, and as I, I agree completely, and I um, 
I, I would not follow an 18 year old anywhere. Um, but at the same time, I do think that they're partially reacting um, to a desire to have the return on investment a little bit more legible. And teaching at a, um, a public state university where the tuition is incredibly low, um, it's, and, and that is a value we agree with, but um, it, it, it's important that we do, uh, we address in the humanities and social sciences a little bit better um, communication of what is, what is the, um, the field they're going into. Because these departments were created at a time when um, there, was, there were fewer people in college. There are fewer people getting an English degree. So it meant a different thing then. So, but now I think um, we have to really look at what some of these disciplines uh, mean to, to undergrads and what is legible from their perspective. Um, I will say one of the things that did happen partially uh, at, at the same time of this, as this, at the, as the ACS, ACLS loose workshop and partially um, because of it, um, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and I created a, a program called the IDEA Fellows. And this is inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. Um, and this is a, a form of hiring new faculty at the postdoctoral level, and then with a transition to tenure track. Um, and the, the crucial thing about it is that the hiring is, is done first at the, at the dean level. So um, the, there is a committee at the dean level that is reading um, first statements of, of diversity and equity um, and that the, the applicants supply. And then the sort of um, can, certain candidates are, are then um, submitted to the department, the most relevant departments. So, so you're essentially trying to find the faculty um, or the faculty of the future um, that, you're, that you're really interested in uh, and then providing them based on, on um, the areas of research, but also their, how they have shown a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, rather than um, having departments put forward um, their desire to, to, to hire a new person in an X or Y field, which is just duplicating the departments and um, the, the disciplines of the past, which I don't see as creating a healthy future for the humanities and social sciences in college campuses. Thanks, Dr. Cook. So we have the last question that's um, directed to Maria. And it's concerning um, some of the, uh, what you might need, what you might think of addressing in the hub that you're imagining, right? Has the commonplace equating of humanities liberal arts with soft skills that supports success in other disciplines been a problem at William and Mary that you needed to address through your hub? If so, how are you tackling it? So this idea that the soft skills that we acquire through a liberal arts education is like supplemental, right? To these other, it's not primary, supplemental that supports these other disciplines. How are you tackling that, um, that cultural uh, idea? Yeah, and, and so let me just say this, that I think that probably in all of our academic communities, there is great respect for the humanities within the other areas, within social sciences and STEM. So you don't need to make that case for our faculty communities, I do not believe. Um, but what I notice is when families are, are bringing their kids to campus, right? They want their kids to be in a place where they feel like they're gonna have some security and, and some job options. So I, I think that the place to really convince people is, is the families, right? And so what we can do is we can provide, you know, great examples of, you know, English majors who are doing really important work of, you know, um, of sociologists and anthropologists who are, are working in, in, you know, communities. And I, and I would just say that many times the concern from families about becoming an English major, becoming a religious studies major, becoming a philosophy major is tied to their own educational experiences. And so many times it's the ones that have the least sophisticated background that are the most worried about their kids getting into something like this. I do think that providing student internships um, so that it, it, the, the applied piece of, of that work is present um, for both that, that student and their family is a really great way of, of sort of emphasizing this. 
Okay, there are no more questions. And I think we're at the witching hour. Um, it, it's at that moment in the winter where um, I, I'm realizing I'm going to turn into a Rembrandt painting if I stay on much longer, <laughs> if the lights go down behind me. Um, so I want to thank everybody here. Um, there were some great comments in the um, in the chat as well, and we appreciate this. And we're also taking notes on the on these different threads of scholarly publishing and format on um, on the definition of a scholar on the humanities and the sciences. Thank you for that great thread, um, Peter. The, um, the a, a few other things we are distilling them. We're going to this this is the first of a series of events. Um, I predict you know smaller great breakout rooms and smaller discussions will characterize. Um, future events so people can kind of get down and dirty in the trenches and think about how to make how to how to design the stuff how to make it work but um, we will follow up with you again please um, uh, do fill out that survey that you'll get in your inbox today or tomorrow and one more time thank you to the loose foundation for making this work possible thank you to my acls colleagues um, thank you to uh, riska and hian and robert and the people behind the scenes who are making the zoom room work and um, and it works so well, so smoothly. Thank you all for coming in your questions and thank you above all to all the participants in the design workshop who are really keeping their eyes on these huge value problems and big issues uh, and also keeping their, their hands in the machinery of the Academy, which I've compared to a Rube Goldberg machine before and I'll do it again. So, um, so thank you all and have a wonderful night, stay in touch and we appreciate your presence. Thank you.